Good morning, everyone. We're excited to take this opportunity to delve into last night's State of the Union address with the Jewish Democratic Council of America, JDCA, and Jewish Women for Joe. My name is Adam Rosen, and I'm a member of JDCA's new Leadership Council, as well as the Ohio Chapter Lead. Last night, the president laid out a vision for a second term, highlighting his successes and the challenges he's had to overcome, which will help bolster his reelection campaign. He spoke out against U.S. efforts to resolve the ongoing crisis in Gaza and demanded a return of the hostages, outlined the successes of Bidenomics in pandemic recovery, reaffirmed American support for our Ukrainian allies, and bashed Republican efforts to restrict reproductive rights. This morning, we're going to hear from JDCA CEO Haley Soifer on her view of that vision, how it aligns with the issues Jewish voters care most about, and how our efforts to turn out the Jewish vote in key battleground states like Ohio will make a difference this November. As JDCA chapter lead in Ohio, I've seen firsthand the difference between JDCA's efforts and the efforts in other close races in key states. Since our full-fledged electoral efforts launched in 2020, JDCA has helped elect Democrats up and down the ticket from President Biden and Vice President Harris, Senators Ossoff and Warnock in the Georgia runoffs, to Ohio's Greg Landsman and Amelia Sykes. Recent JDCA efforts in New York, George Soros's, George Santos's former district, helped bring Representative Tom Suozzi back to Congress and to flip a seat in the House. We plan to bring that energy and organization 2024 to fight for candidates who share what we believe in most, protecting democracy and access to abortion and reproductive care, defending voter rights, fighting anti-Semitism, and ensuring the U.S.-Israel relationship remains strong. I hope today will inspire you to get involved, join your local chapter, and help turn out the Jewish vote where it matters most in November. It is now my pleasure to introduce Haley Soifer, who will give a recap of last night and lead us through some key questions on Ohio's 2024 outlook. Haley? Great. Thank you so much, Adam, and thank you for all your work uh, in Ohio and your work on behalf of JDCA as a member of the New Leaders Council. We're also really grateful to be joined by Jewish Women for Joe, our partners, uh, especially in key states like Ohio, where we're working together to get out the vote for Biden and Democrats in November. Um, this is an early event, so grab your cup of Joe. I've got mine. Uh, this is we're here for the for the talk and the coffee. Um, so I'll start with key takeaways from last night's speech. Uh, just overall, it really felt like a home run for the president at a time when it was really, truly needed. Uh, we see the polls. We see uh, the moment we're in. We know just how important this election is. And you know, just days, two days after Super Tuesday, um, there's no way to separate uh, the State of the Union, frankly, from the election that we are facing. And Joe Biden didn't just meet expectations, he surpassed them. And I'm looking at this from <clears throat> three or four perspectives. The first is really the presentation. Um, and then the uh, and then there are three things I want to share with regard to the substance. On the presentation, the president demonstrated that he's vigorous, that he's up to the job. Um, he was forceful last night. He demonstrated a fighting instinct. Um, he demonstrated vitality. He was quite loud. Uh, the cadence of his speech were very forceful. And he really had command of the room. He had command of the issues. And he also demonstrated the ability to speak extemporaneously when he had to and respond to, at times, kind of crazy Republicans. And now we're hearing from the Republican criticism. Oh, he was too loud. He was too fast. He was too angry. He was too political. These are all wins for the president. Um, his goal, and he actually said it in the speech, was to both wake up Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment. And he did that in the substance of what he said, but also in the way in which he said it. So I actually think this is a win for him. Um, 
Now, we also saw, of course, the heckling, the back and forth with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, but even there, you know, which I would consider to be a low point of the speech because it's such a, it's so uncomfortable, frankly, to watch when the president is heckled. But he he handled it as best he could. He was quick on his feet. And again, he demonstrated command of the issues. I think perhaps one of the best moments in those kind of exchanges was when he he made the point on immigration, like you had a deal. You had one of the one of the strongest border security deals that we'll ever have in front of you. And you Republicans walked away from it. And you saw Jim Lankford, uh, the leading conservative Republican who led the negotiations on that deal, basically agree, agree. So I think in terms of the substance and the presentation, it was a win. Um, now, in terms of the substance, there are three things that I was looking at. The first is kind of the reflections, the accomplishments. On this section, you look at, you know, the, the president makes the case, essentially, are you better off than you were three years ago? And you heard the president say, this is the greatest comeback story that's ever been told in terms of our economic comeback after COVID. This is part of the effort by this administration to push back against what has been just persistently negative media coverage. And the fact that the American people, we see this in polling, don't necessarily see the economic accomplishments that have been made in this administration, or at least they don't give the president credit for it, but there definitely, uh, there definitely has been some, many actually, and the president went through that list. And he did it in a way that I thought was not too wonky. We didn't hear a litany of legislation that was named. What he did is he talked about it in the terms that people understand and that they actually can see in terms of improvements to their everyday life. Cuts to student loan debt, lowering inflation, increasing jobs by historic numbers, investments in infrastructure. So as we all think about the way that we talk about the, how he has been such a strong president and the wins and accomplishments of the Biden administration, I think it's important to take a note from the president, because we also, you know, kind of will will rattle off the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but that doesn't necessarily always resonate. Uh, people don't see that in their everyday life. So I thought he did a very good job last night, looking back at the accomplishments and made it really very easily digestible for the average American voter. Then, of course, there's the forward looking piece. Will you be better off with another year of the Biden presidency and ideally four more years after that? So he talked about what he plans to do. This too, not too wonky. He talked about mostly the tax code. He talked about a child tax credit. Um, he talked about uh, a tax credit for first time home buyers. He talked about increasing taxes on billionaires. He talked about lowering prescription drug costs. These are issues there too that will improve the lives of Americans. And he talked about his plans to essentially lower costs and support working families. So, you know, he I don't think here he overpromised. He talked about issues on which he can actually deliver. And again, connecting them to the issues that matter to people as they head to the polls in November. The second section in terms of substance that I was looking at is the, con the contrast that he made with the former president, right? He didn't mention Trump once. He mentioned his predecessor and the former president 13 times. And here he, he focused on three issues. One, which really he led with was democracy. He said, what makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack, both at home and overseas at the same time. 
Now, this, this was perhaps the most important line of the speech. Um, and today, as we speak, uh, we have a dictator, a dictator on day one, meeting with an aspiring dictator on day one in Mar-a-Lago. Viktor Orban is meeting, the Hungarian prime minister, meeting with her president, meeting with uh, Trump. And you know this, this demonstrates the threat that Trump poses. We know, and, and Biden did mention the threat that he had posed when he was president, whether it was January 6th or other attacks on our democracy. But if he were to be elected to a second term, the threat feels even greater. Uh, he is he is uh, clearly allied with Putin, as is Viktor Orban, and the this notion that he is consulting other dictators uh, the day after the State of the Union just really puts it front and center. So, of course, the second issue that was discussed was Ukraine, uh, which is perhaps the strongest demonstration of democracy being under attack abroad. Um, and then the third issue that was really key in terms of the contrast was abortion rights. And here he really leaned in and he connected it directly to the election. He said, get me a Democratic Congress and I will make Roe the law of the land. So, you know, he he actually promised. He said, I promise you, I will restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. Powerful words, powerful words. And we saw many of the uh, women uh, in the audience there, the, the members of Congress, wearing white in support of reproductive rights. Extremely important. So those three areas were where we saw the biggest contrasts. And then the final section that I was looking at in terms of the speech was his appeal to the center, to the center of the country that is going to ultimately determine the outcome of this election. He wasn't just speaking to his Democratic base. He certainly wasn't just speaking to the left. And he at times was even in what I would consider to be more of the Republican leaning territory, which is why I think that the Republicans looked more confused than I've ever seen them in the State of the Union, uh, perhaps represented best by Mike Johnson, who looked somewhere between uh, fatigued, bored, and confused the whole time, uh, which was quite a contrast from the rather uh, forceful, optimistic, and uh, clearly very focused vice president he was sitting next to. Um, but in terms of that appeal to the center, I think the best demonstration of this was immigration. And again, he talked about the fact that he he's they're trying. Democrats have put forward uh, a plan to secure the border. This is what the Republicans said they wanted. And they walked away from it. Um, he talked about uh, his unity agenda, where here, he, there, these are issues that truly should not be partisan, uh, that really, though we see, do transcend partisanship. Um, a lot of key issues related to the economy. And, and even on the issue of Israel, which um, I will say that in 2023, the last day of the union, Israel wasn't mentioned once. So it was quite telling uh, that there was essentially a whole section of the state of the union dedicated uh, to the conflict between Israel and Hamas in this speech. And what the president did, I thought, was rather masterfully not only, not only um, represent what we know to be his unequivocal support of Israel's security, its right of self-defense, and its um, and his condemnation of the horrors that we we saw perpetrated by Hamas. Uh, he did mention sexual violence in particular. And of course, there were 18 hostage family members and one, one hostage, former hostage there in the audience. Uh, but he also importantly talked about 
what we increasingly know to be the case, and that is the the terrible humanitarian crisis in Gaza and his efforts to try to get aid in and hostages out. Um, I thought that was a really important part of the speech as well. Now, the, the, the there was really kind of a hidden gem in this speech, though, that I want to come back to. I know I kind of mentioned democracy, but the whole speech had an arc. Uh, and and given the cadence and some of the you know heckling, it might have been missed, but it, it, you can you can see it obviously if you read it. Uh, he started with 1941. He started with he mentioned FDR alerted the American people that this was no ordinary moment. Uh, obviously, this was uh, World War II, and he he was talking about the moment that Americans were awakened to the threat posed by Nazi Germany. And then he said, not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault here at home as they are today. And what are, makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack both home and overseas at the same time. Started there. And then at the end of the speech, he brought it back. And I thought he did so in a really important way because he started by reflecting on his age, which obviously he knows is uh, one of the leading attacks against him. But he turned it into a positive by talking about experience. He said he knows the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation. In my lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy. So he tied his age and his experience to knowing what the country needs and to knowing how he can lead us again through uh, defending our democracy and in this battle for the soul of our nation. Um, he never mentioned the election, of course, and one of the criticisms that we hear this morning from Republicans is, oh, it was too political. But I think that this, this really underscored, there's no way to separate this moment that we're in from politics, from the election. They're inextricably linked. Uh, we, we find ourselves today just months in advance of not just the most important election of our lifetime, but an election where there has never been a greater contrast between the futures that are presented by uh, by our president versus uh, Trump. And I really do think he underscored that without explicitly stating it. And this leads to our work in this election. Um, and for those who don't know uh, JDCA, we are the home and political voice of Jewish voters uh, around the country in support of Democratic candidates who share our values. And of course, uh, President Biden among them, but we also are mobilizing Jewish voters in this election for Democrats running for the Senate and the House. And uh, working with partners around the country, including in key states like Ohio, to elect, re-elect uh, Senator Sherrod Brown. Um, and so we appreciate uh, the role that all of you play in this moment as well. And I want to take this discussion now to Ohio, where I know many of you are, um, and back to Adam. Uh, Adam, so you're in Ohio. Uh, and I want to hear how you think this speech was received uh, by Ohioans. What issues do you think were most important to voters in Ohio that they might have heard last night? And uh, how can we use this momentum, uh, this moment as momentum in our efforts to reelect uh, Senator Sherry Brown? Thanks, Haley. Yeah, and, and certainly I heard from many of my Ohio political friends last night that were watching the speech very closely. Um, there's a lot of anticipation about the election here in Ohio, uh, especially knowing that, um, you know, people look at Ohio a little differently than they did maybe eight years ago. Um, but that's not to say we haven't elected some uh, really important numbers to Congress. And we haven't uh, had a couple of wins recently in statewide elections 
as Republicans try to overreach with their legislative and other powers uh, here in Ohio. We had a resounding victory for reproductive rights um, just a few months ago. Um, and I think voters are very keen to uh, enshrining those um, and, and protecting those further from uh, violation by Republicans and, and by uh, folks in the, in the government. And so, you know, I think people are listening very closely to uh, Biden's proposal and, and future vision of uh, enshrining reproductive rights federally, um, as well as just quality of life issues. I mean, I know a lot of people think about the economy and are, are very in tune with how Biden has handled that and avoided a recession. And so uh, I think the speech was very well received and it's important to have a strong candidate at the top. And, you know, as, as, as it goes, you know, I think as Biden is a strong candidate, he will help to uh, lift up some of the other candidates that are so important um, here in Ohio, especially Sherrod Brown, as you mentioned, and, and other Congress folks and, and, and statewide uh, judicial races and a whole all on down the line. So overall, very well received speech. And um, I think it's a great momentum start for uh, what will be a busy uh, campaign and election season. Great. And uh, Cindy, one of the leaders of uh, Jewish Women for Joe in Ohio, um, I'm interested in hearing from you about the issues that you think were most important in the speech last night for Ohioans and, and specifically also the Jewish community in Ohio. Thank you very much, Haley. Um, well, I can tell you that my phone was blowing up on different text chains and messages, um, how excited we were uh, women were across not just Cuyahoga County, but across the state with the president's um, speech, because as Adam and you have mentioned, this past November, Ohioans resoundingly voted to enshrine abortion rights in the Ohio Constitution. And as we are watching the um, Republicans in the both here in Ohio and Columbus in the state house and across the country try to push back on those rights, we are absolutely determined not to go backwards, but to protect and defend those rights. And to hear the president very clearly state that, what he would do if we can get also a Democratic Congress and he'll restore the rights of Roe. So that is really the, the, the issue that we're going to lead on. Um, and I just want to put in here that regardless of what anybody says about Ohio, we are convinced that we can, um, we are a swing state and we can do this for reelecting um, Biden-Harris administration. And as we move forward with women, the issues that we're gonna talk about besides just reproductive rights is all that the empathetic and compassionate administration of Biden-Harris versus the contrast of the evil um, Zoom's build um, comments by Trump and the Republicans that we, um, by addressing issues like student loans, child care, um, climate crisis, and all the real issues that people care about, especially women, as um, you know, caring a caring community, and that's what I refer to as other um, women that I work with. Uh, we can feel really good about what he has achieved, but also the future that he um, will accomplish. And I really think it's important to talk about, as you um, reinforce, the issue of democracy and the rights that we have right now, and we are at risk of losing if Trump is elected. I mean, we can't reinforce that enough. And it's important not just to talk about the word democracy, but to also specify the rights and what it will mean to lose those rights. And we can't be complacent about it. We have to be very strong on it. And as we talk about whether it's the environment, child care, um, you know, green energy and reproductive rights, I think it will really lift um, the whole effort for Sherrod Brown, for Amelia Sykes, Marcy Kaptur, Greg's Landsman. And also, I just want to throw in the Ohio Supreme Court, which is really critical right now in Ohio. It is the only Supreme Court race in the country where we can flip the Supreme Court, which will be so important in preserving our rights. Right. I'm glad you mentioned women because I I didn't mention uh, in my opening remarks the um, the Republican response to the State of the Union. Uh, I guess they thought that putting a younger female senator uh, in the kitchen 
uh, would be appealing to women around the country. Uh, you know, she did her whole, um, let me talk to my fellow moms uh, message. Uh, on behalf of this fellow mom, uh, we do our State of the Union responses from a studio, uh, not the kitchen. I, 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 I was, I was found the whole thing bizarre, and uh, the, and the content uh, somewhat terrifying. Also, you know, representing Alabama, as Senator Britt does, you know, they outlawed abortion in 2019 in Alabama. Uh, as we know, their Supreme Court just tried to ban IVF, and uh, Senator Britt herself is uh, is vehemently opposed to abortion access. Um, and she started by having the, uh, ironically, she started by saying, I'm concerned that future generations won't have the same rights and opportunities as we do. Uh, the irony. Um, Okay, well, we are now opening this up to uh, to all of you, and we have I've uh, posted uh, to please put your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll try to get to as many possible as possible. Um, so uh, Cheryl Unger, uh, coming to us from Florida, um, asks uh, about the Israel Gaza portion section of the speech and uh, cutting away uh, to those who were wearing the kafia. Um, you know, Rashida Tlaib um, is the only uh, Palestinian American in Congress. Um, I assume she she wears that kafia as a part of her, um, you know, what, what we've seen since she was elected in 2018, which is truly her identity politics uh, as a Palestinian. Um, she was certainly in this speech also trying to make a, a statement with it. I saw her putting it on uh, Cori Bush and others, uh, Summer Lee, who were sitting with her. Uh, there's no question that they have a view of Israel that is not shared by the overwhelming majority of Democrats. We saw this in the immediate aftermath of October 7th when uh, representatives Tlaib and Bush could not, and they were really the only two outliers, could not condemn the horror that we saw on that day. Um, they couldn't unequivocally condemn it. Um, and uh, we've seen since then uh, their views uh, with regard to the conflict not aligning with the majority uh, in our party, not certainly not aligning with the president, not aligning with our leadership. Um, now, I thought that the Israel-Gaza portion of the speech was, was very important, uh, and I thought that the president did a good job in not just... Um, not just talking about uh, how difficult the past five months have been. You know, he started by saying the past five months have been gut wrenching for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. That, that part was for all of us. Um, and he started by talking about the massacre that was October 7th. Um, and as I mentioned, it was important also that he he talked not just about the slaughtering of 1200 people, but he said many endured sexual violence. Very important that the president said that. Of course, we JDCA, uh, as many of you have, uh, have been outraged by the fact that there, it took way too long for the world to acknowledge the sexual violence um, that too, far too many endured that day. Um, he talked about the hostages. He talked about the hostage families who were present. Uh, he pledged to not rest until we bring their loved ones home. Um, he, he said, he affirmed, Israel has the right to go after Hamas. And he said is Hamas could end this conflict today by releasing the hostages, laying down its arms and surrendering uh, those responsible for October 7th. So there he was really putting the onus on Hamas, uh, as it should be, to uh, to respond to what is apparently a deal on the table to have an immediate six month ceasefire that would include getting additional humanitarian assistance in and getting the hostages out. And from what we know, it has been Hamas that has been dragging its feet uh, and agreeing to a framework or terms surrounding that deal. He did then shift to the responsibility that Israel has to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. And he did talk about, he quantified 
the toll that this has taken on Palestinians. He said more than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, which was which was important and interesting that the president used that number. This is a number that we have we have seen the Hamas uh, run Gazan Health Ministry put out, uh, but clearly uh, American intelligence assessments must uh, agree with that because he used that number. He wouldn't have used that number unless there was agreement. Uh, with at least that estimate, more than. Um, and he said, many of whom are not Hamas. We know uh, a portion uh, of that number, including uh, thousands, includes uh, Hamas fighters. Uh, but we also know thousands uh, does not. And he he talked about that, uh, which was important. I mean, this this war has taken a, a, a massive toll um, in Gaza, and he talked about the humanitarian toll. Uh, but again, not without first framing it as uh, really the responsibility lying with Hamas. And he did talk about the fact that they use citizens as human shields. Um, and he, and then he talked about his efforts to get more humanitarian assistance. And the biggest and the most uh, kind of standout moment there being the fact that he is directing the military to lead a mission to establish a um, essentially a peer. Um, off of Gaza that will receive cargo ships and allow medicine and food and water to get in. Um, it would be a temporary pier, he said. Uh, so uh, uh, hopefully uh, at some point uh, when this conflict ends, uh, you know, that it would be removed. Uh, but he did talk about the fact that this is his plan to, uh, to get him more humanitarian assistance in. Part of the issue has just been there's no way to really do it by the ground in terms of the borders. Um, Hamas actually destroyed all the crossings, uh, the crossing stations with Israel, uh, where they would would check uh, such items before they go through. Egypt has made it very difficult at its crossing. So the only way to do this is actually by by the sea. Um, with the, obviously, this week we tried airdrops, but uh, there too, um, quite difficult to get to enough people. Um, so this is the president's plan. So that was what he covered in the speech. Um, okay, uh, I will I will go look at the uh, question. Um, questions in the, uh, okay, the next one uh, comes from Dana Gordon in Chicago. Good morning, Dana. Um, should he have mentioned anti-Semitism? You know, I I don't envy uh, anyone who was involved in the writing of the speech. I know what it's like. I worked in an administration uh, starting in the fall, <laughs> you know, before anyone is actually uh, even knows when the State of the Union will be scheduled, but we always know it'll be in the first part of the year, um, <clears throat> usually even earlier in the year. Uh, people throughout the government, throughout the interagency are, are sending to the White House, okay, we hope the following, you know, 10 items can be included in this speech. It is, um, it, there is such a long list of both accomplishments and other policy priorities that people would want in a speech, frankly, including the president himself. Uh, the reality is that not every speech can, can touch on every issue. I mentioned the last year's uh, State of the Union didn't mention Israel once. Uh, that doesn't mean that President Biden uh, didn't have a very strong policy in terms of his support of the U.S.-Israel relationship or wasn't focused on what was happening in Israel. Uh, there was not a crisis at the time, um, necessarily in terms of a war. There was a crisis in terms of Israel's democracy, as we know, that was brewing in, uh, in early uh, 2023. Um, but not mentioned the State of the Union. He he did touch on um, his efforts to combat hatred, and and I think that that is you know the rubric under which I would put what has been his uh, unprecedented efforts to combat anti-Semitism, including going back to March or was it May May of twenty twenty three when he created the. Um, the first ever national strategy to counter anti-Semitism, which has only been strengthened since October 7th. So we know how strong he's been on this issue. But you're right, Dana, he didn't he didn't get into the details. 
uh, I we would have we would have uh, been very happy to um, we would have been very happy to uh, amplify this morning uh, if he had, but we still can because we know that his uh, his record has been extremely strong on this issue. Um, okay, Esta, uh, uh, Esta uh, is asking. Um, about the vice president, uh, about the vice president. Okay. Um, well, I would say, um, a few things. Uh, first of all, I, uh, full disclosure, I, uh, I worked for the vice president when she was, uh, a, a freshman Senator. Um, I saw her, uh, at the very beginning of her, uh, of her, career in Washington, as we know, she was the attorney general and the district attorney in, in California. Um, before that, um, the Kamala Harris that I experienced, um, even though she didn't say a word last night, uh, not that we heard, uh, uh, was quite similar to what we saw last night. Uh, she appeared um, very focused, uh, very um, very uh, principled. You could see her reactions as he spoke about different things. When he spoke about uh, <clears throat> trends uh, such as the the threats that we see to our democracy, the threats that uh, that Republicans have created to our reproductive rights, uh, you could see her 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 kind of views. Uh, and and she um, she also uh, I thought exuded a sense of um, of leadership, of um, of optimism, um, and perhaps that part wouldn't have been as clear were she not sitting next to uh, fifth round pick uh, Mike Johnson. But he just he honestly looked like he had no idea what was happening. Um, and also, let's just fast forward to next year. If we win back the House and reelect Joe Biden, can you just imagine the scene? It's going to be. Kamala Harris and Hakeem Jeffries up there. Uh, all the more reason that we have to do this work. And by the way, we can win back the house. It is within reach. Um, but back to the vice president, I really think that perhaps those um, that have questions or, um, you know, question her record, uh, just haven't haven't listened to what she says, um, haven't experienced uh, a full speech or or moment with the vice president. She's extremely, not only powerful um, and, uh, and principled, um, but she is inspiring. Um, and she is spot on on every issue um, and including those that are of the most importance to Jewish voters. Um, I traveled to Israel with her and uh, and Doug, uh, and I thought the part when when the second gentleman entered the gallery last night was actually very cute. There was some communication between them, and he did his kind of awkward, uh, you know, wave to her. It was very, it was really cute. They have an amazing bond. Um, but I traveled to Israel with them, and there is no question that her support of Israel. Uh, completely reflects and is aligned with that of the president. Uh, now, no one has a longer or stronger record, uh, and certainly uh, as president than than Joe Biden. But Kamala Harris uh, is 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 right up there. Um, and she has been quite active on this issue. She met um, she met this week uh, with Gantz. She, um, she's been traveling around, uh, the world on behalf of this white house, being a wonderful leader and spokesperson, um, defending, uh, not only our allies, Ukraine and Israel, but also defending, uh, democracy. And here at home, she's, I thought, I think it's been an extraordinary spokesperson for this white house on, uh, abortion rights. And as Cindy mentioned, this is the issue that we have seen uh, will drive people to the polls and will not only support abortion access as Ohioans did twice last year, uh, but 
support Democrats and support this president. Um, she's been a great leader. So I I look forward to uh, seeing her up there on the dais next year at the State of the Union uh, behind the president next to Hakeem Jeffries, for sure. Um, Rick mentions Mike Johnson was a mess, really out of his league. I agree. I also don't think he was very well caffeinated. Bad staffing. Get that man's uh, like a Celsius or something. He needed some caffeine. He looked bored, but he also looked confused. Like he didn't know when to stand or sit or clap. And honestly, that that's a problem because he's got like 200 plus people over here looking to him for when to stand or clap. So everyone was confused. But that was also part of the brilliance of the speech because Joe Biden was speaking to the center of the country, but also the room, which on a lot of things, the Republicans didn't know what to do and how to respond. Normally you see this very uneven you know, kind of like seesaw of a state of the union, you know, the Democrats sit, the stand, you know, this was kind of like Democrats standing and then Republicans like, eh, I don't know, because Mike Johnson doesn't know how to lead. Um, okay. Uh, Rabbi Grossman uh, has said the enthusiastic Democratic congressional responses and chants of former years were encouraging when Democratic surrogate come out to vigorously defending Joe and and attack Trump and MAGA, when are the surrogates coming out? Okay, well, that's a great question, uh, Rabbi. Uh, and frankly, it looks like there are 85 of you on this call. Um, you're the surrogates. You, we've arrived. Uh, let's go out and do this work. Um, I think that if there was anything that the, the speech left me with last night, it was not just an understanding of... Um, the stakes in this election, but also how to talk about it. Because as I mentioned, the president talked about it in a way that, you know, he didn't rattle off his legislative accomplishments by using the names of these bills. He he talked about it in terms of what he has done to deliver for the American people. We can all do this as well with our friends, with our neighbors. Uh, we are the surrogates. So so we're here. We're right here on this call. And uh, and perhaps once we all get fully caffeinated, we can go out and be the surrogates and and talk to uh, talk to uh, those who will listen about the importance of this election. We have a few months and uh, this is our calling. We we have to do this work. Um, but in terms of I know you were probably referencing uh, the high level elected officials, I am sure they will be coming out to Ohio. Uh, including in support of, of Sherrod Brown. Um, okay, uh, Debbie has asked, uh, we all know politics are local, absolutely. Uh, we are seeing across the country, local counties and cities passing revolutions stating anti-Israel sentiments. How can we respond and strategize to oppose this? This is really important. Um, there's no question uh, we see this um, in polling, we see it. Uh, and we hear it anecdotally. We we JDCA have have um, have have amplified this issue as well. There is a a deeply disturbing, growing trend of of anti Israel and anti Semitic sentiment in this country, um, and uh, and and we do see this in some cities and states in the forms of anti Israel resolutions. Um, you know, how can we respond to this? I think it is important that that you all, uh, you are the surrogates, that you all uh, speak and, and oppose it. And, and uh, shout out to Adam Rosen, because I know that he recently did that in, in Ohio. It was at the Cleveland City Council. Adam uh, spoke vigorously um, in support of it. Adam, I don't know if you want to reflect on that, because it does seem very connected to, to Debbie's uh, question. Yeah, and that's it's very much a place of where the rubber is meeting the road in local politics and relationships within the Democratic Party. And, you know, I think it's really important that we can show empathy for each other and for the suffering that's happening, while at the same time understanding the political and, and deep seated conflict that is facing us is not going to be solved, um, you know, by shouting at each other and, and being aggressive in, in local halls of government. And so, it's been uh, it's been challenging here, and I know that some friendships have been tested, and 
Um, there have been new political alliances formed and, and shattered. And I think it's really important that we maintain our composure and realize that if we're going to have a good outcome for the people in Israel, for the people in Gaza, that we need to work together and build a coalition that can support a peaceful future. And so it's tough to have that perspective with so much suffering and everything else going on, but it's certainly something that I believe in and that I know many of you probably have participated in in your local um, halls of government or with your friends, uh, you know, in the Democratic Party to have these very difficult conversations. So I think we should keep doing that and sharing our story and really trying to address some of these um, really important issues going into the election. So, yeah, thanks, Haley, for for allowing me to to chat about Absolutely. that. It's something that I'm, I'm very passionate about. Well, that's at the local or state level. Um, we're also going to be doing this uh, for the Democratic Party. Uh, it's coming up. Uh, we, uh, every four years uh, in advance of the convention and conventions coming as well, uh, August 19th to the 22nd in Chicago, um, in advance of the convention, the Democratic Party creates a platform. Uh, the Republican Party used to, last time they just did a press release that will that said we'll, we'll do whatever uh, our dear leader wishes. Um, but the Democratic Party is a platform and, uh, and it, it represents our views on every issue, uh, including Israel. Um, Israel has been one of the more contentious issues in, in as a part of the process that leads to the platform that's adopted at the convention. Um, and this is starting. The Democratic Party platform drafting uh, will soon commence. Um, now, in a re-election, it's... Uh, you know, there's not a lot of room for creativity. Uh, it essentially reflects the policies of the president. Uh, and we're thrilled to um, advocate. JDCA will be strongly advocating for a continuation of what was in the 2020 platform, which was Joe Biden's strong support of Israel's security, right to self-defense, uh, military assistance to Israel, opposition to BDS, opposition to anti-Semitism, of course, um, and it will be updated to reflect the work that this administration has done to combat anti-Semitism uh, and to uh, support Israel, including an unprecedented uh, military aid package that the president um, proposed for Israel uh, after October 7th, which, by the way, Republicans have obstructed for uh, more than four months now, uh, $14.3 billion. Um, all of this will uh, ideally be reflected in that Democratic Party platform. These are the policies and the views of not only our president, but our Democratic leaders, including uh, Hakeem Jeffries and, um, and Leader Schumer in the in the Senate, um, and we will uh, we will do everything that we can to ensure that 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 those policies and positions are adopted uh, by the by the party. And I don't I don't think it will be uh, quite as contentious uh, as as perhaps uh, there is concern there will be because the president has policies that are very clear. Uh, he's been extremely consistent, and he's running for re-election, and those policies will be reflected in the platform. Once that platform is final and adopted in August, uh, that is our platform, and that will guide the party just as the 2020 platform has guided the party um, uh, in the past four years. Um, so that is a good uh, starting point, I would say, for those uh, even looking to create a platform or a position for their state party or local or state um uh, resolutions uh, to push back on in terms of um, expressing support of Israel. Take a look at those party at our party platform that already exists. Um, okay, uh, so let's see. I'm I'm happy to take one more um, question. Mm -hmm, let's see. Okay, either you know, I'm I I was was skipping some, but I I just I'm not going to. Um, there's a lot of commentary about uh the vice president's comments. I it was on Sunday, yeah, it was Sunday, I think. Um, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, um, about Israel, uh, and and questioning whether that indicated uh whether she doesn't support Israel or I I'm not exactly sure. In the comments, uh, there's there's an expression of disappointment. I can tell you perhaps it was not 
well understood because she said um, she started by talking about uh, an immediate ceasefire and then the crowd uh, applauded. So perhaps you didn't hear the whole uh, the whole statement and perhaps it was somewhat taken out of context. What she was talking about is that there is an immediate ceasefire on the table. Um, this, this is similar to what the president said both before she had spoken, he had said this on last Friday and even last night. The onus is on Hamas. And she also made clear in her statement on Sunday some of the same points that the president did last night. Um, she she condemned uh, Hamas um, and she, she, she was pushing Hamas to <clears throat> consider uh, the framework for a deal that's on the table, which is an immediate six month ceasefire that would include additional aid getting in and of course the hostages getting out. Now, it's important to consider that this is not a, a, the kind of unilateral ceasefire that perhaps some of the protesters that we've heard have been calling for. This would be uh, effectively a temporary six-month ceasefire, but it includes the hostages being released. Without that, there's, there's, there's no ceasefire, of course. Um, that's what she was talking about. And JDCA had uh, an email about this because we were concerned that perhaps uh, people didn't hear the comments in their entirety. Um, and uh, we're happy to share that, but you can also find it on our website under newsletters. Um, that email went out on Monday. Um, so I, again, as someone who worked on this issue for then Senator Harris, now Vice President Harris, um, I can assure you that the vice president and the president are um, are in lockstep in terms of their support of Israel. Um, okay, now uh, we do need to speak about all of the work that we're going to be doing to ensure that that the president and vice president are re-elected. Um, so I want to bring Cindy back in uh, from Jewish Women for Joe to talk about Jewish Women for Joe and, and the work that you all will be doing uh, in partnership with us. So we thank you. We are going to be rolling out um, in Ohio Women for Biden-Harris in a large frame. Um, and what that will do is it will provide the resources necessary. For instance, if you're interested in Israel, we will have messaging and tips for navigating um, discussions about Israel people's concerns. We will talk about all the different issues, but we're gonna have some very cool swag. I will tell you that um, the o Ohio Democratic Party is not going to be focusing on Biden-Harris, unfortunately, neither is the DNC. But the women, we are going to do it. Uh, because we know what's at stake and we are confident that um, leading on certain issues that we can flip Ohio blue and it will help Senator Sherrod Brown. And so we are full force. So um, we plan to talk to people by having house parties. We are working on getting a national surrogate in April. But as you said very clearly, Haley, there's no one coming to rescue us. It's up to us individually to be advocates and champions in our own community. And so we will be having different events, both social and strategic. Um, I can tell you that we've even, we will be doing things like, this is just kind of um, out of the box a little, but we're going to, we're showing Navalny um, because we want to really and lead with discussions on really the evil and risk of Putin and then talk about the world order, encourage people to do that, take it from every angle, um, what we can do to really um, have a groundswell of support for President Biden. We'll have pins and things. So um, we will share the link so that you can get involved. Great. Great. And um, JDCA will also, of course, uh, be having uh, phone banks, text banks, uh, a, a steady stream of opportunities for you to get involved, to um, to reach out. We Our, our outreach is uh, exclusively to Jewish voters. I know that is somewhat distinct from from certainly the work of the campaign and the, and um, some of the other groups, but we will be doing this work to engage with Jewish voters. And in the same way that the president last night was truly speaking to the center of our country, our outreach goes beyond Democrats and includes independents. And in some cases, we've even been engaging with Republican voters as well. That's how we played a critical role helping to flip New York 3 from red to blue. Uh, the first uh, in our list of 18 uh, House seats that we had to flip uh, that 
Biden won in 2020 and Democrats lost in 22 that we want to win back. But the truth is we only had to win back five of them to win back the House and put Hakeem Jeffries up on that dais next year. Uh, so we're going to be doing that in this election. Uh, and that means going even beyond our Democratic base and engaging with independent voters. Um, and we are going to be doing a lot of that. And we could use your help. You all are the surrogates, the surrogates have arrived. We're here. We're here. We're ready. We're pumped up. It was a truly inspiring uh, speech that not just underscored that the president has, has done such a remarkable job in the past three years, but that he's he's fired up and ready to go for it another four years, uh, but also the critical importance of ensuring that that's the case because the uh the guy on the other side meeting uh the the dictator on day one meeting with the other dictator from Hungary uh today in uh, Mar-a-Lago uh can't set foot in this White House uh the the stakes are too high the um the issues uh and the threats uh it's too grave and we have to do everything possible to ensure that this president is reelected. So I encourage you all to join us in meeting that moment. And um, I hope you are as inspired by this speech as I am. Uh, and we'll be sending out additional tools as well. So with that, uh, I just want to thank Jewish Women for Joe uh, for joining us today. I want to thank everyone on this call from Ohio. Uh, you're all our partners and, and beyond for joining us today. And if you want to do this again with us, we're having another one at noon uh, Eastern uh, for Nevada. So please. So, hey, Lynn, this is Sue Ellen. I'm just going to add in a couple of things because um, sure. I just want to say thank you, first of all, to JDCA and to you for putting this together and your team, Jewish Women for Joe and JDCA will work hand in hand together to make sure that we elect, re-elect President Biden and, and Vice President Harris. Um, in the State of the Union last night, President Biden outlined so many of the things that are important to all of us, whether it's reproductive rights, um, our infrastructure work that's been taking place, support for Israel, um, support for Ukraine, and all of those issues are so important. And as you've said, we need to just make sure everyone votes and that the Jewish community shows up in a really, really important way for the president and um, for all the Democrats that are running for re-election. Um, it will be a crucial, crucial part of the vote. And I know, I, I've spent time talking to, to nonprofits that will not take a stand on, on Republicans or Democrats, but reminding them that they can have a, a voice in making sure to get the vote out, that we can encourage people to, re to remember that it's their responsibility to make sure our democracy thrives. And um, there are a couple of events. You mentioned the one. There's a couple of events JDCA is hoping, ho hosting in the next weeks. Next Wednesday on the 13th. Um, there will be an event at 1.30 Eastern time. It's Candidate Forum from Maryland's 6th Congressional District. On March 20th at noon Eastern time, they'll be hosting a program on abortion access, IVF, and the 2024 election. April 10th, there's, an, there's a panel discussion on immigration and the 2024 election. All of those things will be sent out through JDCA. Jewish Women for Joe has an event coming up April 10th, Wednesday at 5.30. It will be titled The Wise Women's Guide to Political Giving. So if we've ever been confused about who to give to and what gifts make a big difference, that will be discussed. And I was going to say, before we all sign off and, and get on with our days, we all have the challenge of at least figuring out one way to, to get more involved in making sure that our Jewish vote is heard and that our Jewish friends and colleagues vote and um, continue to talk about it. And we need to make sure that President Biden, Vice President Harris are returned to the White House. And if you wanna learn more, the links for um, both organizations should be in the chat. And I just wanna thank you again for joining us this morning. Haley, Adam, Cindy, you all are, are inspiring and we look forward to working together with you. Thank you so much. Robin has asked for my comments in writing. I have to say, I was I, I had a few bullets, but I was kind of just speaking. And I encourage that. <laughs> you should you all should do the same. I think it's best when we speak from our heart about those issues that matter the most to us. Uh, you know, we can draw up the the list of all the bills that have been passed. But I think what the president showed us last night is talking to people in a way that uh, perhaps is more easily digestible. The issues that matter the most to you. 
Uh, so, so speak from your heart about why why this election matters and why you support Joe Biden. Um, and thank you all so much. Uh, and you know, if if ever there was an indication that uh, that Ohio can can go blue, it's been the inspiring uh, turnout and results of your past two ballot initiatives of votes. Uh, so let's do it again, Ohio. Well, sh you guys should show up and vote for Democrats and reelect Joe Biden and Sherrod Brown. We're with you.